So in other lectures on Emerson's 1836 Nature, I focused on brief passages, the first paragraph, for instance, and the famous transparent eyeball passage as well. And in each lecture, I talked about how, for Emerson, the real action is in the language. Uh, on the level of idea, he doesn't come across as terribly original. If you read Immanuel Kant, if you read Samuel Taylor Coleridge, you see most of his ideas. Uh, but Emerson is a stylist, is innovative and agitated, dynamic, uh, strange. And he's often problematizing the very ideas that he's articulating simultaneous with the articulation. But in this um, particular talk, I want to look at the overall structure of the essay. Uh, you probably notice that it's divided into several sections, uh, which is rather odd given how turbulent the language is. There, there are times in the essay where you feel like there's no structure whatsoever. And indeed, if we were to track closely the ideas, we would find any number of paradoxes in the piece, almost as if Emerson is setting up the idea of logical sequence only to undercut it. But here I want to treat the actual development of the essay and, and take that seriously because it tells us some important things about Emerson's ideas on the relationship between mind and nature. As you track through the essay, you see Emerson move from commodity to beauty, to language, to discipline, to idealism, to spirit, to prospects. What do you notice? You notice a progression from a kind of experience that anyone can have in nature to a kind of experience that perhaps only a select few can have of nature. Correspondent with this is you move from a, an experience of nature as limitation to nature as an invitation to liberation. What do I mean? One of the early chapters is called Commodity, and Emerson explores nature as basically raw material, a resource that we can put to use for our own human uh, desires. Anyone can experience nature as commodity, and indeed, everyone does experience nature as commodity. That is simply one use of nature. But next, nature is also a site of beauty. And almost everyone can experience nature as a site of beauty as well. Um, but again, there's a sense on, let's say, externality. Nature as commodity is based on it as, an, as a raw material external to subjectivity. And the same, Emerson suggests, is true of beauty. Note that... Basically, for nature's commodity, you imagine a farmer looking at a tree. And what is the tree? Firewood. In nature's beauty, you imagine a poet looking at a tree. And what is a tree? It's a synecdoche. It's a part of a larger whole. It is like an element in a larger work of art, with the landscape being a work of art. Those are the first two movements in the essay. The third is what? Language. Nature is a source of language. How so? Uh, we draw on nature for the symbols we use to manifest our thoughts. So metaphors, simile, images, these all come from the natural world. So yet again, nature is kind of a resource for us. And everyone almost, as a human, speaks language. So again, there's a high degree of accessibility uh, thus far. And also there's a sense that nature is something outside of us that we bring inside of us. I won't go into each section, but you, we can just note that the next session, discipline, that's nature as ethics, that the laws of nature, the laws of physics, somehow translate to the laws of ethics. And then we move to idealism, which is based more on the idea that our minds somehow transcend nature, that we are shaped by nature. We are shaped by nature as commodity, as beauty, as language, as ethics. But yet we have the power to shape nature ourselves. So there's a move from matter, we might say, to spirit, uh, from the concrete to consciousness. And after idealism, we move to spirit and prospects. Uh, prospects, of course, counters the opening sentence of the essay. Our age is retrospective. We end with Emerson saying that nature properly seen is something that propels us. It is prospective. It opens us to possibilities. So I've given you an overview of this movement, and I thought that I would look at the last section, Prospects, as a, at a very important passage, which really highlights this relationship between finite and infinite limitation, liberation, nature, and mind. And the passage goes like this. 
The problem of restoring to the world original and eternal beauty is solved by the redemption of the soul. The ruin or the blank that we see when we look at nature is in our own eye. The axis of vision is not coincident with the axis of things, and so they appear not transparent but opaque. The reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is disunited with himself. This is interesting. This suggests that the way we see the natural world is more subjective than objective. In other words, if the world appears fragmented to us, it is because we ourselves have a fragmented mind. If the world appears to us as opaque, uh, recalcitrant, solid, limiting, um, it is because that is a manifestation of our interiority. Now you remember, perhaps, that in the discipline section, Emerson makes an important distinction between understanding with a capital U and reason with a capital R. This is a distinction he borrows from Immanuel Kant by way of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, really by way of a minister up in Vermont, um, one Minister Marsh, who did an American version of Coleridge's A's to Reflection. Understanding, as Emerson means it, Coleridge too, is our empirical faculty. It's that part of us that allows us to reach scientific conclusions. It's that part of us which studies the visible world and the principles which generate the visible world, which organize the visible world. Reason is that part of us that is more intuitive, that is able to sense invisible energies underlying the visible world, spirit, soul, energy. Ultimately, for Emerson, these two faculties need to work in concert, that you can't really activate the reason until you have used the understanding. For instance, I understand basically how, um, say, gravity works. Great, I can get that on a purely physical level. But then if I'm, say, a poet or philosopher, I'll use reason to translate that physical dynamic into, say, a moral principle or an aesthetic principle. Gravity deals with the attraction and repulsion of various elements of matter. That's how the world works. But then I can translate that into, say, a moral principle about what we should be attracted to, what we should be repelled from. Or I could translate that, that into an aesthetic principle um, about how a poem should actually uh, be a kind of uh, rhythm between attraction and repulsion, um, fragmentation and unity. That's an example. So Emerson here in this passage I just, I just read, where he says, when the world is fragmented, the, the, the um, axis of vision is not coincident with the axis of things. He's basically making a claim here about the reason, uh, saying that, okay, even if I understand the world physically in terms of its opacity, if I can't see through the opacity to moral or aesthetic spiritual or, or principles behind the opacity, then the world will simply appear to me as something limiting or recalcitrant. But when the reason awakens, the world, as it were, becomes transparent. I can see through things to the principles generating these things. Think of it this way. Think of standing on the top of a cliff and there's an ocean below you and someone pushes you off the cliff. <laughs> well, gravity's going to push you down. There's nothing you can do about it. That's the causality of the physical world, the if-thenness of the physical world. And your understanding can get that. I can understand how gravity functions. I'm going to fall. I'm just like an object. But what if the reason kicks in? The reason can say, well, yes, I am merely a hunk of matter hurtling toward the ocean, but I can decide how I'm going to fall. That's where the freedom comes in. That's where the subjectivity comes in. We're not simply free of the natural world, able to do whatever we want. We are able to shape what the natural world has given us. And the way to shape it most effectively, Emerson suggests, is to consent to it. Yes, I am going down with gravity. Yes. But what can I do? I can decide how to fall. I can do a flip. I can do a gainer. Uh, I can do a swan dive. I can do a jackknife. Um, that's where the reason comes in. So ultimately, if you see the essay as a movement, it moves from understanding at its most basic, everything that is visible can be a commodity, to reason at its most sophisticated. And reason is where we are free. Reason is where we get to say what nature will be when we experience it. So as you go through nature, uh, pay attention to that movement.